tonight in chapter 4, verses uh, 10 and following, I want to try and conclude uh, our studies in the book of Philippians. I want to share some thoughts out of Count It All Joy by David Jeremiah as he gives some uh, great insights into this particular part of this passage tonight. Uh, <clears throat> if there was ever a word that summarizes American hopes and obsessions, I believe it's the word more. More money, more success, more luxuries, more gizmos. We live for more, for our next race, our next house, and the things we already have. And even though they are wonderful, they tend to pale to comparison with the things that we might still get. In his book, Lawrence Shames, in his Hunger for More, he makes an analysis of contemporary values and he traces the discontent of this uh, ravaging appetite of a nation gone after prosperity. Uh, he says, Shames says in his book, during the past decade, many people came to believe there didn't have to be a purpose. The mechanism didn't require it. Consumption kept the workers working, which kept the paychecks coming, which kept people spending, which kept inventors inventing and investors investing, which meant there was more to consume. The system properly understood was independent of values and needed no philosophy to prop it up. It was a perfect circle, complete in itself and empty in the middle. And as Shames wrestled with the significance of, his, of this problem, he looked at the empty circle. This is what he said. It's my conviction that the version of success that was dominant in America in the 1980s a success defined almost exclusively in terms of money and virtually without reference to the substance of one's achievement has served us badly. A vision of success based on money alone, more money each year, is a dangerous dead end at a historical moment when real wealth can no longer be counted on to increase. Over time, by the rigid rules of that game, there will inevitably be more losers, fewer winners, less joy, and more depression in the contest. For reasons of simple self-interest, we need to cultivate a new uh, definition of the well-lived life. Now, when you come to our text for this evening, the Apostle Paul, as he is writing from his jail cell, he speaks about the Philippians' generosity and uh, <clears throat> his need for the care. In verse 10, he said, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Tonight, as we look at the joy of serenity, count it all joy, because the book of Philippians is all about Jesus. It's all about joy in our times of life, even through times of adversity. Charles Swindoll, in his book called Simple Faith, he cites a poem that expresses the discontent to which our society has certainly caved into. Someone penned these words, and as Swindoll reiterates those in one of his books, it starts out with this, it was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted, to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 
I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, but I never got what I wanted. Tonight, as we look in this passage where Paul speaks so poignantly, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. You see, the Philippian Christians realized the importance of investing. They realized the importance of giving. They realized the importance of sharing. And they certainly realized that the Apostle Paul, hidden away there in a prison cell, with a little privacy at his hand, that there were needs that he had in his life. They were one of the few churches that he had helped establish through all of the area of Asia Minor that would remember him and realize the importance that he had needs in his life, not that he asked, uh, not that he expected, but they were needs that were prevalent in his life. He spoke about how that their care for him had flourished again. He said, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. There were times that the opportunity did not avail itself. But even in the midst of that, Paul was grateful that they thought about him. They cared for him. <clears throat> and their love expressed that to him. In verse 11, he said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, for I have learned, we live in a society tonight that has never learned. The Bible says, ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. We live in a world tonight that has not learned. But Paul, in the midst of all of the stuff that was going on in his world, <clears throat> Paul realized that there was a peace of God that surpasses all human understanding, and it was because of his incredible, personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Paul learned about the peace of God here and the God of peace who promises to be with us, we've discovered these blessings can be ours as we learn right praying as we learn right thinking, and as we learn right living. Now, after Paul voices his gratitude for the Philippians, their continual love and care for him, he expressed his own spirit of contentment. Paul was not rejoicing simply because they had sent him a gift, nor was he even hinting to the fact that he was expecting another. He was just going on record to let them know that in whatever state he found himself there with to be content. Now Paul said, I have learned, <clears throat> I have learned in whatsoever state I am there with to be content. Tonight if you and I went out and we began to take a poll of people that we would run into and we would meet, I'm confident of the fact that out of the many we would speak to, that the great majority of those would say they are discontent in the present state in which they're in. And so Paul said, I've learned that. Uh, when you come to that word content, it literally means self-sufficiency. A man should be sufficient in himself in all things. So in the place where God has stationed you and me tonight, we should be content. His contentment was something he possessed. It was something that he had learned. He had learned how to be content uh, during days of poverty. He also had learned to be content even during the days when he was uh, abased in suffering. Paul was certainly qualified to make this kind of judgment. He had once been stoned. He had been dragged out of a city. We know that from Acts chapter 14, verse 19. He had been beaten and thrown into jail. 
Acts 16, 22 to 24. He had been plotted against by the Jews in Acts 20, verse 3. He had been in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments and torments, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, according to 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 5. He had experienced trouble on every side, accompanied by the outward conflicts and inward fears. He had known abundant labors. He had known frequent, <clears throat> pardon me, times of imprisonments and close encounters. He had come with death. There were five times he had received 39 stripes. From the Jews, there were three times that he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned and three times Paul experienced shipwreck. He once spent a night and a day out there in the murky waters where he had been shipwrecked. He had faced death from robbers and from his countrymen and from the Gentiles and from false brethren. He had often experienced times of weariness times of sleeplessness, times of hunger, times of thirst, times of fastings, times of being cold, and times of nakedness. In the midst of all those things, Paul learned how to be content. I thought about the Apostle Paul last evening as the rains were descending, as the cold winds were blowing, and I paused in reflection and prayed specifically for people out there that are living on the streets of this world, living in parks, sleeping on benches, not having a place to lay their head in the cold and the damp. And I could not help but think <clears throat> how oftentimes in our own personal Christian lives do we seldom think when we walk into a warm church building when we walk into a warm house and go to bed at night and in the warmth that we have, there are many in the world like the Apostle Paul in some of his times when he was cold, when he was without clothing, <clears throat> when he needed the warmth and the love and the friendship. How many times do we pause in our moments of discontent and thank God for the provisions of our lives? Aren't you thankful tonight that you're not out in the cold somewhere stranded? Aren't you thankful tonight that you have warm clothes to wear? Aren't you grateful tonight that you have a warm home to go to? I was reminded of that when I was called yesterday about someone who had nowhere to stay during this cold. I was thankful that as we as a church could put them up in a motel for a couple of two or three nights to try to help them until they could make more provisions at their workplace to be able to take care of themselves. Many people tonight, many people, even living in their homes of comfort, are discontent. Paul was living in a prison cell. Paul said, I have learned. And as I gave that litany, that catalog of events a few moments ago of the things that he had experienced, I could not help but thank, oh God, how often do we fail to thank you for the provisions, all that you have needed, your, all that we have needed, your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new to us every morning and every morning and every day and every night. We ought to be thankful. We ought to be grateful for the things that you do for us. David Jeremiah mentions a story in his book called Count It All Joy. And in this book, there's, a, there's an interesting story that says years ago, there was a syndicated column carried the story of a group of famous American financiers who in the early 1920s had met the Edgewater Beach Hotel, had met at the Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago. In personal wealth and financial bearings, they control more money than was in the national treasury. From time to time, their names appeared in the press. Their influence was enormous. Their success was fabulous. 25 years later, the writer of that same column called the role of these princes of the financial world 
One of them was a man who had cornered millions through wheat speculation. He had died abroad and insolvent. Another one of those wealthy financiers, the president of, the nations, uh, of a, one, of, uh, one of the nation's largest independent steel company, had died totally broke. The president of the New York Stock Exchange had recently been released from prison and a member of the cabinet in the Harding administration after being let out of prison for health reasons had died at home. And the greatest exploiter of the bear market in Wall Street had committed suicide. The leader of the world's greatest monopoly had also died at his own hand. In summarizing the list of men, this columnist wrote, all of these men had learned how to make big money, but not one of them had learned how to live. The Apostle Paul would say, whether in the good times or whether in the bad times, Paul would say, I have been in places where I've been abased, brought low. I've been in places where I have abounded when I've had plenty. Let me tell you, the Apostle Paul had learned the many, many things that had happened in his life that brought him to a place of contentment. In fact, Paul and his associates uh, were entertained at the home of Lydia. She was a prominent, wealthy woman over there. In the book of Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were given a banquet at the home of the Philippian jailer. Over in the book of Acts chapter 16, Paul was entertained by the natives on the island of Malta after he had survived a shipwreck in chapter 28 of the book of Acts. And the whole story of the Philippians' relationship with Paul was one of caring and giving and ministering. You see, but for Paul, it really didn't matter whether he was feasting, whether he was fasting, whether Paul was rich, whether he was poor, he had learned how to be content. <clears throat> when writing to his young mentor that he had mentored in the faith, Timothy, Paul wrote this, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Paul's contentment, Paul's contentment was inclusive in any situation and in any locale that he found himself in. He learned to be content everywhere and in all things. And may I remind us tonight once again that Paul was not writing from some penthouse somewhere. He was writing from a prison cell. He had learned an important secret in life. So many people go through life just thinking, well, if I could just re relocate somewhere else, I would be content. Or they think, if I could find another church home, I would be content. You see, if they could just get the next job in the community that they have so longed for, they would be content. There was a man one day that came to Socrates, the great philosopher teacher, and they asked him about the unhappiness of his friend. And Socrates answered, he said, the trouble with that man is that he takes himself with him wherever he goes. Did you realize discontented people take their discontent with them everywhere they go? But there's something else about contentment tonight. Because of the power of God that strengthens you and me, Paul says, he goes on and he said, I know how to be abased. That means to be brought low. And I know how to abound. That means to have plenty. 
everywhere and in all things I've learned both, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then in verse 13, he says, I can do all things. He didn't say I can do some things. Uh, I can do a few things. He said, I can do all things. That meant all things in any situation of life, in any crisis of life that was taking place. Paul said, I can do all things. And the way he would do that is through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Paul realized in and of himself, there was not the power in and of his own flesh to be able to do all things. But he knew that because Christ because in him is the resurrection of life. In him is the power of life. Paul realized that it would be in Christ's strength that he would be renewed day by day, that he would be given the ability to be able to be strengthening and strengthened in whatever situation that he was in. And I want to say to all of our church family tonight, wherever you are, regardless of what's happening in your life, just remember this. Jesus is with you. He promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be a present help to you in times of trouble. That's where Paul could find his contentment in a very discontented Roman world in which he lived. You and I live in a world tonight that is very discontented. And let me tell you, the only contentment that can ever be is to know Christ and to know his peace and to know his power, and to know his love and ending, and to know his salvation, and to know his strength. Paul goes on and he realizes contentment comes because of the people of God who support you. Paul's main purpose for writing this letter was to, to express his great gratitude for what the Philippian congregation had done for him. He began this section by telling of the joy his joy at receiving the gift they had given him. And while he noted the interruption that had occurred in their care for him, he was not scolding them. He knew they had tried to minister to him at one particular point, but was unable. William Hendrickson uh, suggests two possible reasons for this inability to be able to help Paul at that particular time. It, he said it may have been that no messenger had been immediately available or that for some reason or other it had been impossible to collect the gift from the various members. Let me tell you, that gift finally arrived. It had been sent by way of Epaphroditus, or one of those great people in the Philippian church. And Paul said there, he goes on to say, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Verse 15, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. But you only. Unfortunately, many of the churches that Paul had been such a great part of, many of them had at this point forsaken him. Many of them had forgotten the, him at this particular point. But thanks to the Philippian church, Paul evaluated this great generosity of this congregation. And let me tell you, he came to three important conclusions concerning giving and receiving. Number one, Giving brings blessing to the one who receives the gift. Paul was thankful for the great generosity of the Philippians because they gave, he said, I have all and abound, I am full. But secondly, he learned giving brings blessing to God. You see, from God's perspective, this Philippian church gift was a sweet-smelling aroma and acceptable sacrifice well pleasing to God. He goes on and says in verse 16, for even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I'm full. Having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma 
an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing notice to God. There was a third thing that Paul realized about giving. Giving brings blessing to the one who gives the gift. Paul told the Philippians they had done well, and he described their gift as fruit that abounds to your account. Let me tell you, all of the giving, all of the giving that goes through the ministries of this church, I was just reading today in the Baptist Messenger how uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, uh, they're expecting uh, it to be up uh, even from last year during this time of pandemic. I was reading an article just before I walked in here in the sanctuary uh, tonight about the pandemic and what it had caused and that in many churches throughout uh, the land, in many churches around America, that there's the great possibility that many of them will have to close because the giving has been so down during this time. I want to remind all of us that God owns it all. It's all his. May we not fail in our endeavors to give. May we continually to be faithful in our stewardship to him as he is faithful in his stewardship to each one of us. May we not let down in our giving during these challenging times. When I read that about that many churches will have to close my heart was grieved because I thought there's nothing that is a greater indictment on the people of God than to give up on giving during challenging times. I believe that's when God blesses the most. During the times of our adversity and we reach deep into our pockets and we, we reach out and we give beyond measure, I believe it is then that God is more pleased with us because sacrificially we are depending totally and solely upon him. And I'm thankful and I'm grateful for this church that we've been able to help people during this time of need. And it's all because of the gracious giving of this loving church. Paul mentioned the three groups of people who had been used by God to support and sustain him during his days of confinement in Rome. And that first a group was the brethren who are with me. He goes on in verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You see, Paul was saying, because of the generosity, because of your faithfulness to give, because of your faithfulness to uh, give to ministry, Paul was saying that the fruits of your labor in giving will bring glory to God and will be added to your account in heaven. Let me tell you, that's why I believe Max Licato, when he made the comment, it's what we do in the here and the now that makes the difference in the then and the there. Let me tell you, you and I only have a short time in this life to make a difference. If we want our lives of labor, our lives of giving, our lives of sharing, our lives of stewardship, for the Bible says it's required that a steward be found faithful. And I believe that's faithful in everything that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul realized that the Philippian church would have fruit in heaven because of their giving that was a sweet aroma to God and gave glory to him. Paul realized how important it was and he brings about this idea in verse 20, now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. And he says, amen. That word amen or amen as we hear it. In songs, we often say amen. But when we end in prayer, we say amen. That word just strictly means so be it. We as congregations have failed so many times in amening God's word. So be it. That's what it means. And let me tell you, we should never be ashamed in church to say amen. That means so be it. God has said it. That settles it. And we ought to be grateful and thankful and praiseworthy in our attempts to give God the glory. And then in verse 21, 22 and 23, he gives a greeting. 
he gives a blessing. Notice he says there, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. There had been many people that had been responsible for being good to the Apostle Paul, for being kind to him, to reach out to him, to minister to him during his time of ministry. And he did not fail to be grateful for that. He didn't fail to be unthankful for those things. He says, the brethren who are with me greet you. And he talks about the brethren that were there, those who had attended him, those who had helped him. And then he goes to verse 22 and he says, all the saints greet you, but especially those who have Caesar's household. Caesar's household, remember, there were many that the apostle Paul had won from Caesar's household to Christ. He had won them by sharing the gospel. He realized that his being in prison, even though falsely accused of things, even though it was uh, many times for sharing the gospel message of the good news of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, the salvation through the blood, the blood atonement. Let me tell you, through resurrection story, Paul realized, and as he shared, even there in the prison, and people were saved, and prisoners got to hear the message. Paul even realized that in that situation, where most people, it would have been a place of total discontentment, but only for the grace of Almighty God, only for the strength that Paul found in Christ Jesus, could he find contentment there because he was still preaching, he was still teaching, he was still sharing Christ, and many of Caesar's household were saved, and he greets all of these people. And then he says in the last verse there, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. When I think about that, how wonderful it is to have the grace of Almighty God in our hearts and lives because that is what brings contentment whenever we have such a passion for Christ as the Apostle Paul did and he used those discontented circumstances of life and he turned them in to lessons of contentment. For he says, for I have learned. And no one better than the Apostle Paul had been through more challenging times, through more persecutions, and many, many defeats. But he never, ever let it affect his witness for Christ I don't know about you, but I thoroughly enjoyed the book of Ephesians that we took many weeks to finish. Now we have finished the book of Philippians, and we will move to the book of Colossians a week from tonight, where we will begin another third book of the prison books that the Apostle Paul wrote as he was confined to prison cells. Those were Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. God bless you. Please be safe. And God bless you this week as you continue to do your everyday uh, duties that you have to do. And until we see each other again, hopefully on Sunday morning, may God hold you in the palm of his everlasting arms. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, once again tonight, we pause in gratitude and praise. Thank you for the wonderful words of life. That, Father, just exude off of the pages of, of uh, biblical writ here. How that you, in moments and times when we are challenged on every hand, that all we have to do is look to your word for great comfort and peace and strength and hope and courage to face each tomorrow. God bless our church family. Be with them. Help them, oh God, to keep the faith and to keep looking up, and to keep having a positive and a right attitude. 
in this world that is filled with so much wrong. Father, we thank you for this night. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.